What's up and welcome back to Nostalgia Pod, giving you your weekly look, your first weekly look of 2020. I am Pat Sheehan, joined by my co-host Dave Martinson. Dave, welcome to the decade, man. How you doing? <laughs> the Roaring Twenties. Welcome 20s. indeed. <laughs> we made it. Uh, it's, a, it's a packed show, you know, because mm. we, uh, we had a lot of content in December and, and beginning in this month, we did best of the decade. We're obviously doing the best of 2019. Still have to finish movies up. And uh, we're going to be talking about um, one of those movies that we haven't seen yet, which is why we've been a bit delayed in, mm-hmm. um, in dropping oh, that and recording that. Um, but because we've had a bit of a layoff around the Christmas break and the new year break, we have a lot of really strong content to be catching up on uh movies and tv specifically uh luckily the music world pretty much gave us like one kanye and travis album that was a bit underwhelming so uh we're, we're okay with putting those to the wayside to mm-hmm. make to clear out some space for um, boys yeah <laughs> for mando and mr robot and then a couple of uh, contender movies this year so If you want to catch uh, any of that content we've been dropping over the past four years now, go to uh, youtube.com slash nostalgiapod or go to soundcloud.com slash nostalgiapod and you can get it in your earballs any way you want to. You follow us on Twitter at nostalgiapod. Before we jump into the the TV and movies, though, we want to start with awards season, which officially kicked off last night with the Golden Globes, perhaps the most... uh, uh, I don't know if irrelevant is the right word, but least respected of the yeah. major award shows that are going to be happening. You know, like the the film actors or the screen actors guild and and those sort of um, uh, ones I think have a little bit more prestige. And the Golden Globes are usually seen as but like more of a fun award show. Mm-hmm. Um, but we got something a little different last night, Dave. You, you you watched a little bit of it, right? Yeah, yeah. I'd say I watched probably. 80 percent um yeah it's funny because the globes are decided by the hollywood foreign press which is like 90 people Mm -hmm. who don't work in hollywood and yet they're and they 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 often make uh out of nowhere nominations and and in winners that don't really have any bearing on the oscars or the guild awards yet it seems like uh Hollywood, the talent loves to go to this show because it seems to be just a very fun time where all they get they all get hammered and hang out in this small room where the reaction shots look great, you know, and in between commercial breaks, everyone's talking. It looks like they're a lot of fun. And yeah. I mean, 18 million people watch the show. It's it is it's kind of funny the 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 galaxy brain ass cachet that the show has. But you know, Oscar voting I think ends tomorrow, so this is kind of the last impression some voters will have in their mind if they for some reason they're waiting to the last second to vote so yeah so and, it's weird and it's pretty funny that, as you said it's this group of 90 people not in hollywood but somehow are are now shaping the narratives leading up to the oscars uh with their choices that don't always reflect what the oscar voting body is going to be doing themselves so it's uh it's always fun to be reading the, the articles and the takes the day after the Golden Globes. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> like, I just couldn't help but think of uh, when Taron Egger- Edgerton won for Rocket Man movie we love. It's a great movie. But yep. he's not going to get nominated for Best Actor. But he actually won one of the Best Actors at the Globes. It's like, we've seen this before. This is Aaron Taylor Johnson winning for Nocturnal Animals. This happens from time to time. But it's so funny, everyone's like... What does this mean? Is this a new bellwether for Rocket Man at the Glow at the Oscars? My columns? No, you, you don't pay attention, do you? <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's certainly. Um, I mean, some of the things they get right, like there's certainly a correlation, I think, between the like the writing award that they give out, like that that went to Tarantino last night, and usually mm-hmm. whoever wins that writing award will also win at the Oscars. But for the acting and for the other categories, it doesn't always translate. So. Just always funny to kind of see what comes out of it. What are the narratives you are paying attention to that came out of last night? What 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 kind of raised your flag or do you feel like is indicative of what's to come for the Oscar season? 
Yeah, I mean, sometimes there's like confirmation of things you were thinking. So in this case, like Joaquin winning for best actor for Joker, something we most people just kind of expected from the jump. I think the only really top contender had been Driver for Marriage Story this whole time. And it does feel like he's in that pole position. He's kind of just been the betting favorite the whole time. And I guess that hasn't changed at this point, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Same for Pitt, I think, with supporting yeah, actor. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But then you look, I mean, then you look at the what's it on um, best actress in a musical or comedy win goes to Aquafina. Aquafina is the only one in that class that even has a chance to be nominated for best actress at the Oscars. So I guess that kind of sets Aquafina up more for that fifth spot she had been kind of vying for with a bunch of other actresses. But mm-hmm. yeah, just little stuff like that. You know, I, I guess the uh, Rocket Man song might have the leg up now it didn't make you know i mean we already have the short list for a lot of those kind of awards um but i guess 1917 is probably the biggest talking point just because that was the most i guess out of nowhere even though people had acknowledged that the, that and mendy's were at least in play to a certain extent but to see it, it win the two big prizes um is, is is interesting to me just because a lot of the Conventional Wisdom has been changing about late releases having awards impact because now the Oscars are happening a little earlier now. Mm-hmm. Movies not being seen until the end of December or even early January has not worked for just about every movie that's done this. Beale Street, a famous flop by releasing too late last year. Um, Little Women's Coming came out on Christmas, but 1917 isn't going wide until this week. It's only been in like a dozen theaters to this point, but yet all the all of Hollywood has seen it and all of the HFPA have seen it. And I guess that's all it took. So I think this definitely, I mean, he was in Mendy's speech, right? Yeah. Thank you. Because this is going to get people to show up and see our, uh, see our movie. So that was, that was definitely the biggest, biggest thing to me. Do you know how many theaters 1917 is in right now? Is it 11? Yes. 11 theaters. <laughs> that, that's insane. It, it, it's also funny because, you know, people stay up to see this award show and obviously like the last, the last awards, the most people are, are seeing this movie that they haven't even been able to watch yet. Most people not been able to watch yet getting rewarded. And it's, it's kind of a bit of like a, it's for like the, the people that aren't totally tuned in are just kind of watching for the fun of the award show. It must've been a bit of a head scratcher because it's like, oh, I didn't even, I didn't even know that this movie was out yet. Like I didn't, how are we mm-hmm. awarding this and this not out? So, um, you know, certainly, I, th- I think it's it's worthy to note. I, I don't know if it actually means anything for the award season. I, I do think 1917 is going to be a movie that will be heavily nominated. Um, and having not seen it, I would be surprised if it beat out things like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Marriage Story, uh, a couple of these movies that we've been talking about. Um, but certainly this is a good sign, you know, and, and something, you know, that they, a feather they can put in their cap. I'm not taking too much away from it though. How much credence are you putting in this is like really propelling it to the front of the line, making it a favorite. Yeah. I mean, from what I know, it's a very Oscar movie in terms of like the technical aspects of it and all that, but it's also not going to get any acting nominations and probably not going to get a writing nomination either. And those are like requirements to yeah. get, Best picture. Uh, best picture historically especially the screenplay part um, I guess the screenplay part's a little more likely but um, yeah I'd, I would be really surprised given how late it's been mm-hmm. to, to, to really pull through given given the strong competition it faces I mean heck, there's even been a, a bit of a parasite wave and yeah. that was cool to see um, Bong win for uh, you know the foreign film award which it's kind of annoying that Parasite isn't eligible for some dumb reason, but yeah. Uh, yeah. 1917. That's definitely the, that's definitely the talk of the show from yeah, a awards he, perspective. Bong had a, had a great um, quote too from his speech yeah. talking about how, you know, once you get over the, the one inch barrier of subtitles, you'll be, uh, you'll be able to enjoy all these other foreign films that you're not aware of yet. Um, and certainly I think Bong actually might be the biggest winner. It seems like they're really pushing for him. They had a big party, day before um in his honor and, and kind of just hyping up parasite and bringing a lot of different reporters there so I, again it's still late it's late in the voting process for the oscars so if anyone hadn't voted that could be something that pushed it but it is good to see that um 
he, it seems like he's getting a little bit more level, more recognition as this is go, going mm-hmm. along. Any anything else you take away from last night, or mostly just like okay, word season's kicked off now. Yeah, I, I think missing Link winning best animated it's not a bellwether at all. Cool <laughs> no. to see, cool to see Disney take the L there, but uh, that's not going to continue. I also wanted to correct something. Uh, so the Writers Guild Award nominations were just announced today, and 1917 was picked for, uh, for one of the original screenplay noms. So given that the screenplay noms are, are uh, divided between original and adapted, I guess 1917 probably ha- has the track there. So that's a good sign for it. But yeah, um, we got those Tom Hanks gifs, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Golden Globes, don't put too much stock in them. Uh, but hopefully you enjoyed it just as we did. And let's talk about some, some TV shows we enjoyed. Let's start off with The Mandalorian. Mando. Mando. Uh, the Disney Plus bellwether show. Um, pretty much the reason people signed up for Disney mm-hmm. Plus right away. Everybody well, you're not watching this. High School Musical, The Musical, or whatever the fuck it's called. <laughs> you know, I, I watch one other show that's on Disney Plus. I watch Encore with, with my, my fiance. It's a show hosted by Kristen Bell where she gets these drama clubs from years back to get together to reenact their plays, to re- redo the plays that they did mm. when they were in high school. It's, it's, you know, it's mindless. I'm not really getting too much out of it, but over the Christmas break when it's a bit of a dead time and we need something to, to watch before The Bachelor comes back tonight, oh, gosh. Uh, really filled that, that void. So uh, definitely recommend Encore if you just want something light and mindless but Mandalorian I <laughs> that's why people is, are watching this review for yes. the other Rex <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, if you like the Mandalorian you'll certainly like Encore no uh, the Mandalorian though John Favreau at the helm of this thing we, we reviewed the the first two episodes I believe I believe so yeah only the first one. yep and because yeah, there's two in the first week when it launched right yeah man shout out baby Yoda because uh, we at the time we talked about how smart it was to to have that at the end of the first episode and how it's just like captured cultural conversation. Yeah. It has just hasn't let go. Every time baby Yoda does anything, the internet is <laughs> goes fucking wild for this little guy. It's awesome. We're in a, a-, a-, a- B Y after baby Yoda. <laughs> Can you remember before I can? <laughs> yeah. B Y and uh, a Y. <laughs> there you go. Um, man. So now that the Mandalorian is wrapped up and we talked a little bit about this on our, best of the year pod check that out how are you feeling about it Dave? how are you feeling about the show overall as a whole didn't make your top 10 list it just missed it are you feeling like this is a satisfying star wars property are you pleased with it are you disappointed where are you at yeah no no, no. uh very satisfying i felt satisfied basically the whole run um it just got not at the uh, nudged out of my list is because i felt a strong year for television in 2019 mm-hmm. that's all um yeah it's the best star wars uh star wars story of the year that's for sure check our rise of skywalker review for more thoughts on that um <laughs> clear out some time for that one yeah clear out some time for sure <laughs> <laughs> no uh, yeah the mandalorian man it's uh it's kind of what i wanted it's kind of what i asked for what i expected when i was told they're making a show about a mandalorian bounty hunter cool and there's a fucking yoda in it a baby one that's cute as shit and is the meme of the year. Yeah, I'm with it. And yep. from a filmmaking aspect, we have what really well done traditional television making where we get uh, procedural in the middle and then get really serialized at the end and it wraps up perfectly together, like justified in a lot of other uh, old Western shows. People are calling back to it. This uh, from a structure standpoint, I think it's great. I think a lot of the people that were, like bitching week to week about the lack of immediate plot gratification. I just feel like they don't watch that much TV. Like (laughs) like I never really understood that critique at all. Cause like, like people calling some of the middle shit filler. Like if that's your main criticism that just didn't feel important to you, but like that's what, this is what TV does, man. Yeah. This was good. And it's a star Wars doing it in a good way. So yeah, I, I really like just about everything about it. And, uh, and the finale I thought was dynamite in particular really um, wrapped everything we had built to and, and fleshed out up in a really satisfying way. So that's an obvious uh, path forward for season two, which we know is coming back in the fall. So yeah, I uh, really, really, really dug it, man. 
Yeah. It, you know, what, as you're talking about, like the, the people who are critiquing the procedural aspect of it in the middle and just kind of feeling like it was filler, it's like, it, if you ever enjoyed Law and Order, like it's the same shit. You, yeah. you're not, there's no plot movement in any of those episodes. You're just case of the week. You know, it's like this is mission or adventure of the week. But this actually had an overarching payoff as yeah. some of those people involved in this mission of the week ended up coming together at the end to help with the overall plot development and plot movement at the end. So uh, is that not the appeal of watching a bounty hunter on TV be right. a bounty hunter a little bit? Like, right. What? <laughs> Especially when like some of the, the film, cause the, the really talented stable directors on this show. And, you know, you think yeah. back to the, uh, the, the Bill Burr episode where there's that like um, flashing. Yeah. Strobe um, light scene. Strobe light. See, hallway scene you know there's some really cool f- techniques on the show as well it really looks awesome the whole time and i'd recommend reading the uh, there's a slash film article about the uh, stagecraft technology where they basically are using led screens to make the environment so it, it's kind of the evolution of the green screen we, we heard about this with first man as well so they the way they made this set and they shot this whole show this entire show was shot in uh, Los Angeles on sound stages, but it looks so great. And mm-hmm. then you combine that with really cool camera techniques, and again, just I think good, good overall filmmaking uh, procedure. It's uh, and, and satisfying Star Wars stuff along the way. It's really, really good package. Yeah, you talk about the directors this season. We talked a little bit about Deborah Deborah Chow and uh, how excited we were to see her at the helm for Episode Three, um, The Sin, but. Dave Filoni and Rick Fumiyawa are at the helm in pretty much every other one that isn't a Favreau uh, directed episode. And uh, man, I think they both uh, capture the essence of the story and really give it a place. And to have so many different people at the helm, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard also directs one of them Mm -hmm. um, as well. But they all really created this cohesive season, but still have you know put in these little like stylistic flares like you talked about uh i mean you might uh i want to make sure i'm saying his name right sorry um it's rick fama yiwa yeah fam- um, rick fama yiwa. Yiwa. Yep. direct to dope um he's uh he really brings this like sense of like tightness to it you know he directed that episode we talked about with like, the strobe lights but also you think about like the coloring in that episode how when the ship goes on lockdown it's like this like tinted red color um or then you think back to um like dave's dave filoni with like the gunslinger and how they're out on, in like the sands there of tatooine like it's this very mm-hmm. like um very western vibe um it i i felt like the show always felt consistent from episode to episode, even with different directors at the helm, but it still brought something different every week that I thought was, was fun or interesting um, stylistically at least. And it, it, one of the things I think I liked most was this didn't, it didn't hold to a structure of, of okay, 45 minutes hour long this one might be 46 this one might be an hour long and it really just serviced the story the way it needed to every time and didn't um didn't put things in or drag things out just to do it it felt like they had an idea for each story they had they know what they wanted to show and they executed it that way and it also seems like that was kind of the way that they did the season because it seems like they have a clear direction of where they're going with this and it's set up for i think an excellent uh season two in terms of direction with now Mando and baby Yoda having to go find baby Yoda's home planet. So just really impressed with the, the direction and, and the, the creative uh, forces that went into this and how they executed everything. Yeah, man. Shout out to dark saber. That was cool to see as a Clone Wars fan. Um, shout out G G and Carlos Pizzito not pulling up until episode seven. Yep. Saving that Moff Gideon heat for the end, just doing a full on Gus Fring 2.0. <laughs> right. All right. good. <laughs> They're like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna hire you to play Moff Gideon. And then it's like, okay, so what's what's the character? Okay, so he's Gus Fring in space. <laughs> and like, oh, okay. Cool. Um so you, you said you really liked the the last episode, which was Taika Waititi directed. Um you know, what did you like so much about that? What do you think really made the 
the final episode of such a good episode because it's getting a lot of praise online. Uh, just the use of IG eleven, mm-hmm. the using the red herring that was the thermal detonator in his chest, and you know they're kind of playing with some headier themes about uh, droids being having a soul or not, stuff like that. Um, you get Mando's face, you get his name, all that stuff, um, and then seeing the jetpack first tie fighter fight at the end uh, i think was cool and also a nice way to flip uh the rarely threatening presence of a tie fighter on its head by having you understand actually how much how intimidating that would be to normal small group of people so yeah I, it, it was really thrilling yeah i liked how they they brought so many things together whether it was mando um and his feelings about droids and kind of flipping that on its head um or uh, even like uh you know the thing with ig11 how he's and then also uh, like you said the, the dark saber at the end which i didn't know what that was i just thought it looked cool then doing some more research it seems to ties into some real star wars lore mm-hmm. so setting up some some real fan some real deep fan services so those real star wars fans who have seen and and partaken in online chats and watched all the clone do with this were you excited when you saw the dark saber were you like yes here we go yeah that was cool i mean i knew exactly what it was of course but mm-hmm. yeah that was sick and uh leaves more questions and that might actually tie directly into clone Wars season seven which is coming up next month on Disney plus, but yeah, that, that was cool. Cool to see. And kind of like seeing baby Yoda in the first episode to a lesser extent, just kind of making your mind think a little bit and open up more possibilities. So, and we know, uh, Gamorreans are coming in season two. Favreau, uh, posted a concept art image or was it a, uh, costume? I forget, but yeah, I'm, I'm stoked for season two, no doubt. Any any predictions for season two? Any anything you're thinking we'll see for sure, other than what's been confirmed? No, I really don't have any, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think that that's that's the fun thing about it is that it's very just like it's open right now. It can go in any direction. Um, and you know the fact that they're going to be just traversing across the galaxy trying to figure out where Baby Yoda's from. The possibilities are endless for this show, and. Um, I have a feeling it's not going to be slowing down anytime soon. So Mandalorian season two, we'll be talking about it. Give us your thoughts on season one. Hit us up on Twitter. Uh, why don't we jump to Mr. Robot now though, which a show that we've been following for right from the start. Um, big fans of this show, even when I think the, the hype train for it slowed down quite a bit following season two, which is fairly, I think critically, um, I don't want to say panned. It's not really panned. I think just critically not as beloved as other seasons Mm -hmm. of the show. Up and down. Right. Inconsistent, perhaps. And, man, uh, I caught up on this show all in, like, the span of a week because I had fallen behind with watching Watchmen, holidays, things like that, and, like, losing, like, like, this part of me that I've been following it and really like been holding on to and i think what i feel most impressed with with this season which did make both of our top tens this year um is when robot first started i think the thing i found most appealing was what's the psychological stuff going on here and then it pretty quickly kind of turned into like the mission of things and how they're pulling things off and you know tyrell being this agent and uh elliot's fight between who controls him, him or Mr. Robot. And then it really kind of came back around with this vision for the last couple episodes of who is Elliot? Like what's the real Elliot? And it didn't have to necessarily like answer it for us, but I think it left us in a place where we're allowed to like kind of make our own understanding of it while giving us enough answers where I feel satisfied, not just totally like, why the hell did I watch this for four seasons? So I felt (laughs) very like happy with the way that Ashmael wrapped it up. How are you feeling about, the the series finale and the last season as a whole yeah i I liked it a lot um i like the way they wrapped everyone up i think the way tyrell went that went out um price dom angela 
White Rose. Angela Angela was was definitely cool for shock value. Yeah. Uh, capping off the season or starting off the season. Mm-hmm. Um and she definitely seemed like the character that had kind of run out of rope coming into the season. So I guess it made sense. Yeah. Um so yeah, I like that. Especially the the uh Dom Darlene stuff towards the back third of the season I thought was incredibly strong and everything with the airport was 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 fantastic. Yeah. Um and the the her uh, Dom's dark army handler, I, I love I love that character. She was really menacing. Um, the taxidermist, yeah. she, 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 it was yeah, Jan. That was funny seeing her have a small role in Maisel, where she was being a normal person again. And I was like, what the fuck is this? Um, <laughs> and of course, along the way with this season, we got Esmail doing his uh, film nerd stuff. You know, the the episode five, the, which ends with the Central Park chase. That was a silent episode. They talked in the beginning and the end, that's it. Mm-hmm. Episode seven, where uh, the stuff with Vera is literally structured like a four act play yeah. with, on like one stage. That was really mm-hmm. sick. Uh, episode nine had a really cool tracking shot. Episode, was it uh, 11? Uh, is this like alternate mind bending reality thing? And the finale obviously plays off that. And it, it was really funny too, to see a lot of blog posts be like, uh, late season twist in episode it's like like all these people taking that like shit literally mm-hmm. i was like did you not watch mr robot at all why are you why are you thinking there's like actually multiple like physical elliots like this what are you talking yeah. about yeah i thought i thought that was funny just seeing people tell on themselves but yeah overall, <laughs> overall uh the, i thought the it, it was i think i think it's satisfying to anyone who's stuck with the show and um from a plot perspective you know the, the, the plot movements with uh F society redistributing wealth and uh, the dark army going down and white rose going down. So that stuff all really worked. That was cool. But then also the character stuff worked as well. So yeah, really satisfying. Yeah. You know, I wonder how she kind of went into after the third season being like, I only want to do one more of these. Let's, let's wrap this up. Um, because it, it feels like, um, it feels like some of it makes a lot of sense and maybe it was where he wanted to go from the beginning. Like, I think he knew Mr. Robot was part of like a split personality with Elliot where these were like a coping mechanism for some deeper trauma that he had gone through. Um, and those, those bones are kind of sprinkled throughout the season, especially the stuff with Krista. Um, but I wonder if, if the right with well, the white rose ending was a bit more like, okay, I want to wrap this up. Let's, let's kind of get priced to, to become this like patsy almost in a way for some other things like have him kind of downfall and then Elliot kind of um, pull him into the scheme to like prop him back up. Um, I I don't know. Just interesting to think about. And I don't know if we'll ever really get an answer with that. I did feel like the white rose stuff was satisfying, even if maybe um, it felt like he went down a little too easily for how big and powerful he was sure. i really liked the episode though that flashed him out as a character where you yes mm-hmm. as, um you know a young uh, rising up the ranks and you know kind of showing himself to his lover and all that very interesting stuff um i don't know i i th- you, you mentioned a lot of really uh, awesome moments that happened this season including like the the four act play with Vera and things like that. Was there, was there anything that maybe didn't work for you, or you felt like maybe was uh, like a critique of this season in a sense? Um, I mean, it's actually funny. It's the longest season of TV I've watched in a long ass time. Thirteen episodes. When was the last time we talked about anything that long? Uh, I really don't know. Um, yeah, but. I mean, Vera coming back, I kind of like forgot who Vera really was beyond the fact that he like killed Shayla early on. Like I really didn't remember what, he, what his significance was overall. Um, mm-hmm. Then again, it was cool to see young M.A. acting. So I'm with that. Yeah. Um, you know, we got one little last bit of Leon. That's true. Badass. <laughs> that was cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's always been an indulgent say, show. I, I didn't think so, that part made a lot of sense with Leon. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't know. think the part was with. Yeah, I mean, like all of a sudden, the Dark Army is like this overarching force that has control of Janice and Dom, and doesn't ever really let go of anybody unless they they die. And Leon's just like, yeah, I just got out, just didn't want to. You know, that was a gun for hire, and 
now I'm doing this. It's like, eh, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense. Um, and and I, I agree. I think for me, the Varys stuff, even though I really enjoyed the format of the episode where he really got to shine, I, I was left a little confused. Like, okay, so what was he here? What was his significance earlier? Had to go back and read up on that. So, um, I don't know, maybe I'm telling myself as like a Mr. Robot head right now. Uh, <laughs> one thing I think that stood out for me seemed <coughs> just really, really strong to me. And it felt like it, um, it felt like it played a significant part into like the emotional impact of the season. Um, so just really wanted to highlight that. Any final thoughts on Robot as a, a show in general? I can't remember ever watching, I, I can't remember another show like so I'm definitely going to miss it. Yeah, I think that's kind of the takeaway. It's just the the breakout vehicle for a new voice in Sam S. Smile. You know, someone who's really technically impressive, but also is not afraid to, to have different kinds of narrative, you know? Mm-hmm. So definitely a, definitely a success, no, no doubt. And uh, definitely a, a show I think people will look fondly on as the, the time goes on. So let's... Really a uh, really fun ride, no doubt. Absolutely. Check it out if you haven't watched Robot. Um, why don't we jump to some movies now, Dave? Why don't we start with Bombshell? So Matthew J. Roach, uh, director of such comedies as Austin Powers and Meet the Parent, uh, political, historical, things like current or, or more recent uh, political historical movies, including like Recount, Game Change. Now he's doing his take on uh, Fox News and how some of the women at Fox News played a role in the, the downfall of, of Roger Ailes and trying to flip some of the power structure. And um, I saw this movie just yesterday. It's been out for a little while now, a couple of weeks. I was in a fairly full theater of, of hmm. old heads it was there was probably like 30 people that were probably 45 or older in there um which i was surprised at because i i've seen middling reviews only 67 percent rotten tomatoes i don't think it's killing it at the box office um but i can't i walk i walked away satisfied i thought it was a okay movie flawed i don't i don't think it's perfect but i think it's it's got a lot of really good performances a lot of that guy or that that girl uh hmm. supporting actors um but really carried by the the main three of uh Deiran and kidman and margot robbie how did you feel about bombshell yeah um it's only made like 25 million so far too so by no means a a smash hit not an expensive movie but you would have thought it would have done a little better than that coming out in the christmas corridor um yeah it's really traditional movie. You know, we compared it to Vice going in like everyone else just because of the subject matter, the time of year was coming out, all that tra- uh, tra- trans, uh, transformational performances. This guy's with Lithgow and especially uh, Charlize last year with Christian Bale. The, the, the compares political uh, about conservative people. The comparisons are obvious. But tradi- yeah, it's, it's just really kind of traditionally told movie, you know? And as someone who never really knew who Gretchen Carlson was, like her time in the air kind of ended before I was really that invested in, you know, how anything like that worked. Mm-hmm. Um, it was kind of cool to see, see the story. Cause I didn't really know, know it too well. Um, I do think the movie kind of struggles with dealing with the fact that like, it's a me too story and an important one and probably one that doesn't get as much credit given who the people involved are. But I also think the movie doesn't examine why that is. Like, no one likes Megyn Kelly for a lot of reasons. So, <laughs> no one likes Megyn Kelly. <laughs> heralding her for yeah. good things she has done in the, in the, in this space um, doesn't really make anyone feel that good either. You know, right? So, I think I, th- I think there's just a lot of baggage going on. But performances are good, and I think the scene with Margot. And mm-hmm. Lithgow, where Ailes is being his, his fucking abusive yeah, creep self, so. that was really effective and really uh, hard to watch. And uh, Charlize becomes literally a Megyn Kelly clone. Mm-hmm. And she's so good. 
So yeah. I still like the movie, but yeah, it's uh, there's a lot, there's a lot, lot to it under the hood, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I felt satisfied because I felt like the message was powerful. I thought the performances were really good. Um, where I was left a bit conflicted, and it actually kind of really hit me near the end of the movie when there was a scene that I, I, I don't know if I if I found it effective or if I liked it. I, I really can't tell. It's a scene where. Uh, Megan Kelly goes up to what? What's her name? Kayla is that Margot Robbie's character's name? Yep. And composite she, character. And she says to her like, "Oh, is is Roger harassing you?" And they have a conversation. And Kayla says to Megan Kelly like, "Why didn't you speak up? Like, you could have you could have done something. You could have changed something." And Megan Kelly's like, basically says like, "Well, I wouldn't have been on TV then. Like, you know, the, this is the sacrifice I had to mm-hmm. make to like fit in this culture and kind of." move myself forward and not only does that kind of i think highlight the conflict i have which is you know we're following around megan kelly as the 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 i guess flawed heroine of the story Mm -hmm. so like bring that to the surface and it, it almost like hit the nail on the head too directly for me um it, it just kind of left me, it left me feeling a bit jarred at the end of the movie about like how I really felt about the movie as a whole. And uh, again, not a knock on the performances. I think, um, I think the top three and pretty much all the supporting people are also really, really good in this. I really laughed out loud when Richard Kind was Rudy Giuliani, like just <laughs> what a ridiculous casting choice, but phenomenal in that as well. Um, but yeah, I was left a, a bit conflicted with that. For sure. Still still enjoyed it a lot. Um, what else stood out to you about the movie? Um, I mean, I think that, that that's it. You know, it, it's simple, but before, like you said, the performances are good. It's still a good message, even with the baggage. So, yeah, I found, I found it satisfying. You know, um, it's not like, I, would, I don't think I would confuse it with being like a feminist story. It's really just more of a dramatization of the events. But, Given the time we're in, I still think it's good to see that. Um, and yeah, I mean, Charlize truly is fucking insane with how good she is in this. Yeah. She's really, I feel like, leveled up as an actor. Like, since Mad Max, I feel like mm-hmm. everything she's, she's done, she just really embodies the character. I wanted to ask you, how did you feel about Lithgow as Roger Ailes? I thought he was really good, but almost like my affection for Lithgow, which I see him as this very like likable, almost like dad figure. You know, you think back to, what was it? Um, uh, 30 rock from the sun or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. not, not 30 rock from the sun. She's third rock from the sun. Um, and like how he plays this very like lovable dad figure in that. And I, I was almost like found, found myself liking Roger Ailes too much <laughs> in, in this. And I was like, Oh, I feel dirty almost. Mm hmm. Yeah, well, I think that kind of gets to uh, who he purportedly was. You know, he was someone who uh, could be a good friend and could be a really supportive figure, both professionally and, I guess, just personally. So mm-hmm. I think the way he played it was was good because he didn't just play him as this over-the-top cartoonish villain, even right. though he was obviously a very villainous man, both in the way he acted and uh, the way he uh, shaped our media landscape, you know? So yeah, he he, he was yeah. good. And a yeah. really convincing fat suit, no doubt about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, certainly looked like the job of the hut that he mentions <laughs> in the movie. Um, yeah, bombshell. I mean, do you do you think sixty seven percent is too high, too low, just right? Rotten Tomato score. Yeah, I mean, Not there's matters, a lot of baggage but... with the movie, so it makes sense that there's a bit of a polarizing nature to it. Not really surprised about that. Yeah, I can't imagine Fox News watchers are enjoying this movie much. So, um, probably affects it in some way as well, I imagine. But, anyways, but that, that, that's enough of Bombshell. We got some other movies to get to. Why don't we move to Uncut Gems, Dave? This is oh how. Oh, my God. Are <laughs> you having, having a good time? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, man, Adam Sandler, dude. So uh, the Safety brothers, most recently Robert Pattinson. And that was just one of them, right? Uh, the other one was in it. I, I always get them confused. 
Uh, yeah, Ben Benny was was in Good Time. Yep. Right. And did Josh direct it? Is that they they both still directed it? Both. Yeah. Oh, okay, gotcha. Mm-hmm. Um. So this movie had a lot of hype coming out around it. You know, you have Sandler in a serious dramatic role. The trailers were awesome. Um, it just looks like a, a cool movie in general. You know, this guy with this gambling problem, KG's involved. Um, it seems, it's, and kind of what I got from the trailer and what the sense I got from the movie is uh, Howard, played by Adam Sandler, it's just all it like he has nothing that like holds him back. He's just constantly looking for like that pleasure center of his brain, that excitement, that dopamine rush. He's just constantly looking for that, that thrill, that high. And that's really mm-hmm. what you get with this movie is it feels like you're on this, like this like crazy high throughout it, but this like almost anxiety producing high throughout the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And it was quite a ride, man. What was your experience in the movie theater with it? Yeah, no, it's a, really tension laden stressful viewing experience and i think that's especially the case when you're in a captive audience in a theater um yeah i think that that's that's probably the what's so great about it is just the way it maintains the thrill the whole time especially when nothing is super out of left field in the plot whether that's the ending or anything along the way yet the way it maintains the tension and with the performances being so good, the way they anchor that down, it's a really special movie. You know, one of the parts about it's Daniel Lapidin, better known as only tricks point never, I think has such an impact on this movie because music plays such a significant role on the feeling of this movie. You know, it basically starts off with this like 45 minute, like very light fun uh, score for like the whole opening it's like kind of crazy but then it slowly like kind of dives into the this like intense anxiety producing like really uh like almost like violin screeching type feel to it and um I feel like the score of this really drives the, the thrill of it because it, it, I, I mean, I felt everything I was supposed to feel in this movie and I felt like the score was like pushing me along the way. It was pretty amazing. How did you feel about the score in general from this? Yeah, no, I think you nailed it there. It's a uh, really, uh, really choice, really uh, kind of tactful use of music to move the plot along. It's not, not, not as in your face as say like, parts of interstellar or something you know it's uh right. sometimes it's subtle but yeah that, that really worked and then you have like more obvious musical cues when you have literally the weekend playing his <laughs> 2012 stuff you know um he was actually pretty good and of course kevin garnett yeah. is really really good and looks just as he looks exactly like he did back then because he's so in shape <laughs> yeah. yeah no it, it's a cool movie there's so much to it you know and like um like uh, julia fox Oh, total man. ingenue, total out of out of nowhere, and she's like a, a star. Obviously, she's incredible yeah. in the movie. Yeah, and they they found so many people that aren't well known actors or aren't even actors at all yeah. going into this that took on major roles. Like the the muscle guy, I don't even know even know if we get his name, but um, the one who shoots him at the end. It's just yeah. some like tough guys just- that they found in like New Jersey somewhere. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Like you need to be in this movie or those two like Jewish guys who they keep they gave the fake watches to. And, you know, yep. uh, though that's just like a guy that they like knew and, the, and his brother. And they're like, oh, you guys are perfect for this movie. Like what? the vision to like <laughs> cast these sort of people oh, yeah. and have it fit in the movie, not like horribly derail it. I think it's just very impressive. Um, what else about the movie do you like? Yeah, well, it has an amazing New York identity. Obviously, the yeah. Safdie brothers are uh, New York to their core. And having this movie take place in in Manhattan and Jersey and all that, and obviously the Diamond District's the main focus, and uh, it's just you know New York by New Yorkers is really cool and um, kind of has that identity. You also have the other side of that being uh, a lot of Jewish characters in the movie, a lot of Jewish stuff going on. You know, yep. it's uh, oh. yeah, culturally it's just it's just really really cool. And then like having Adina Menzel be uh, Howard's <laughs> like a strange wife. Um, yeah. 
don't really think of her as a normal dramatic actress as much. I usually just kind of think of her for like singing Let It Go and stuff like that. But yep. um, she was good too. Yeah, man, it's... Uh, and Garnett too. I mean, Garnett, you know, you listen to the Safdies talk about how they made this movie and they worked on this script for years and years and try to get this made every time they got even a little bit of cachet as they were making movies. And, you know, at one point it was going to be Amari Stoudemire. At one point it was going to be Kobe Bryant. Uh, for a while it was going to be Joel Embiid. You know, the way they kept changing the script to accommodate which uh, athlete they were going to use in this movie is just a really cool idea to see how, I think how talented these guys are. They can adapt on the fly like that. But also Garnett's, it was fucking perfect. Yeah. And, and, oh, and so good. And like, honestly, like, I think when well, I was just sitting there, sitting there towards the end and I'm watching um, Howard watch his parlay win at the end with Garnett and I'm like, I know the Celtics win this game. I'm a basketball fan. I already know they win in 2012. I knew, I know the yeah. result and I'm still like having the heart, my heart beat out of my chest because mm-hmm. it's so great at keeping that going. Yeah. And like, you can't deny that. No, absolutely not. Yeah. The, the ability that this movie has to like get your heart rate up. Like I, I wish I had looked at uh, like my watch at, afterwards which, which tracks my heart rate because i like i know it definitely spiked a couple times i was leaning forward like rocking a bit in like the last like portion you know especially <laughs> seeing like julia fox trying to like run away from those guys like the scene where they're like he's throwing the money out the window and then they hold him out the window and shake him down it's it's yep. all so so stress inducing and he's always just like on the edge of like being killed like getting the shit beat out of him and like he lives on that thrill that plays that part so perfectly because he has this like neuroticism that I think fits the character so well. Um, but I, w- I was actually wondering, cause you know, I think when he didn't get nominated for like the SAG awards or for the golden globes, people yeah. were a little bit disappointed. Um, do you feel like this is a performance that's worthy of getting a spot in an acting, you know, an Oscar acting category that is um, already pretty stacked. Like, do you feel like yeah. he's up there? Well, I think that's the problem. It's because it's this year or 2019. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, he's like seventh place in a five nomination race. Mm-hmm. And he's going up against guys that are just as famous and talented as he is, if not more. Yeah. So it's just kind of bad timing for Sandler. And, you know, maybe if this movie came out a month, a month earlier, it might have been able to get more momentum and perhaps get a Golden Globe nomination, and maybe that would have mattered. But it's a busy-ass race, man. Like, Eddie Murphy might not even get the Oscar nomination. Yeah. So it, it's unfortunate because, like, Sandler does this, like, what, once every 10 years? He's like, yo, by the way, I can do dramatic stuff. I, I mean, I'm really talented. I usually just like getting my you know, mediocre Netflix bag, but I can do this. And like, that would have been sick, but yeah, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Now, you know, especially because like you said, he is, I think outside of that top five. And, um, I think about like like the scene where he's kind of like breaking down and starts crying and Julia's like, uh, like oh, gee, I, w- I want to show you the the the, the, tat- the tattoo I got. This will make you feel all better. Um, <laughs> and he's like, I'm such a piece of shit. Like I you know, like I, that part, like I, it, it kind of lost me a bit. And I felt like when he was playing like like the shit bag, who's just like uh, trying to like always like spin a deal or get one by on somebody. I really bought it. But then when it came to like those more emotional moments, I don't know if I it necessarily hit as much. And I think that's like, if I had to make one knock against the performance, that would be it for me. But still, I mean, like I, I love when Sandler decides to just like put these like acting chops on. Cause then you're like, man, this guy is so much more talented than he actually like allows himself to be at times. Like there, you know, he, like you said, he can make, just get the bag, like make those stupid comedies that are pretty low brow for the most part, or he can like throw himself into these roles and just absolutely crush it. It's really just amazing to, kind of see him play mm-hmm. those two dynamics um i wanted to ask you real quick how'd you feel about mike francesa in this movie oh uh, he was really good yes <laughs> oh <laughs> that's the stupidest fucking bet i ever heard of <laughs> talk about some popes but this is the real pope. <laughs> the way he says that that's the stupidest fucking bet i've ever heard <laughs> like, 
<laughs> so good. Um, really, just the the casting that's so inspired. Yeah. We didn't even talk about Lakeith Stanfield. Yeah. Um, and man, he's so fantastic in this movie. Like the way that he just kind of plays this like I don't even know the right way to put it. this like con man. I guess yeah. like well, how would you describe him? Well, there's like a specter of like menace to him the whole time. You always expect right. him to do something worse than he ends up doing. And I think that's just mm-hmm. the way the character is written and the way that Keith plays it. But like, yeah, he, he, he was really, I think, really important to the movie, you know, both just kind of being the in between between Howard and KG, but just kind of the presence he has and his relationship or lack thereof with Howard was really, really great. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, a scene I think he he absolutely kills and a scene that really stands out to me from the movie is the weekend's performance, not only by the stylization of the shots in that scene, mm, that you orange know, where, jacket. Yeah. The orange jacket and how Julia is wearing like the white and out of all the people in there, they're the two that like stand out when the, the black lights go on. I thought that was so like smartly done and just a shot that's like burned into, into my memory from this movie. But the way that he just is like, kind of like, sulking around the room in that and like then it, they have that interaction where you know how it's like what the fuck man like and then he just like is so like calm just like you know what's his name like the mania or something like that is so calm yeah. and then mm-hmm. you can tell him he's like seething and then they start like going back and forth and i'm like i, man, I would not fuck with this guy like, howard's got some balls to be going after this guy but goddamn, right. like, look he's stanfield like you said menacing is a good word for it yeah you know also thinking of that scene once howard and julia have that fight and he goes howard goes away in the car mm-hmm. uh, and julia's like walking back and like she she like yells to people in line like uh like uh what the fuck are you looking at and some girl you know is back uh nothing Not much, much. And then, yeah and then and then she's like yeah that's why you're fucking waiting in line yeah <laughs> like the cadence to that like brief, really brief moment i thought was so fucking fire yeah. <laughs> It, it's it's a great um like little touch to like add that like new york feel because that's a, that's a mm-hmm. definitely an interaction you would see like waiting outside a bar or a club yeah. in new york city for sure no doubt um I, I don't know any other thoughts on this movie there's there's so much to like about it if if, if people are are unsure or if they should see this i mean I, I can't really think of a reason not to unless you just like don't want your heart rate to get up yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, we, we mentioned the tension. I just wanted to call out the, those moments towards the end where, like, there's, like, this fake out sort of like, oh, Howard's going to get fucking got or kidnapped or something. Mm-hmm. It doesn't happen. Like, when he takes the garbage out, when he goes back to his apartment, nothing happens. But you're just, like, sitting there waiting for something to happen and it never does, you know? Yeah. I, th- I, thought, I thought all those kind of scenes worked really well. Also, I made an interesting observation. Uh, so Uncut Gems currently has made $36 million here in the States. No international release yet. That's good for third most for an A24 release ever. It's only about uh, $13 million behind Lady Bird here in the States. So it's going to do that. It's going to become the highest grossing A24 release ever here. Um, which is interesting because this movie has a weak cinema score and a weak Rotten Tomato user rating. It's almost like none of that shit matters. <laughs> uh yeah you know it's it's funny because i i've seen a lot of people giving bad scores because they went to go see a sandler movie uh not knowing what kind of sandler movie it was <laughs> imagine bringing your kid to see this be like oh, i mean it's rated r movie. right but like ah man just it, it's a funny thought to me um before we wrap up i did want to ask you how'd you feel about the way it ends with like howard mm-hmm. getting got and taking a bullet to the head and julia getting the money how did you feel about that it's, it's the only way it could end it had to end that way mm-hmm. he couldn't get away still, with it i was still shocked oh yeah that was, was shocking shocked. it was in the moment i was like fuck dude and the way like the camera pans down spins as he falls and the music starts it's like mm-hmm. it's really picturesque the part when He's like, he won the tip off. That's the hardest part of the fucking bet. And the guys are just like sweating in that box and staring at him. I was like, oh, <laughs> there's no way this is going to go well for you, dude. But man, uh, w- w- what a joy. Uncut Gems, I think we'll, uh, we'll be talking about when we do our best movies of the year pod for sure. So mm-hmm. stay tuned for that. Moving from 
a, a movie that keeps you on the edge of your seat the whole time to one that is a bit more tempered. Two Popes uh, from Fernando Morelli's. Yep. Mar- Mariel's, I think. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. He, he made Some City of God there. back yeah. in the 90s. That movie's amazing. Um, ah. That is a really good movie, actually. Um, I, I, didn't ha- I didn't see that when I was checking out his filmography. Two Popes. Got John Leo, uh, also known as now as Pope Francis, who gave us who gave Sienna College a shout out today. So shout out to our guy. Well, he did. Yeah, he was. Uh, there was some students from Sienna College who were attending a, a mass. He was saying or something like that, and he said, I "Want to welcome the the people, the pilgrims from this area, huh. and also people from the institution of, of the, Franci- the Franciscan institution from upstate yeah. New York, Sienna Got College." It. And I was like. Oh. <laughs> Frank, my very guy. Franciscan, Siena College, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that that's that's the main focus there, no doubt. Shout, shout it out, Anthony Hopkins playing Cardinal Son, twenty third, December twenty third, I believe. Um, no, maybe a little later. Uh, whatever. Anyways, two popes, <laughs> Dave. How are you feeling about the uh, this this tale about these these two? opposites who kind of find a common ground and come together uh good good i like the movie um cool movie to make because it's about historical figures but like there's no record of these conversations it's all historical fiction it's all writing and this this i forget the guy's name but the guy who wrote this movie he also wrote was a theory of everything darkest hour or bohemian rhapsody as well T- talented guy um having just having price and hopkins just talk for most of the movie mm-hmm. when there's a good script like that it's, it's just really good you know mm-hmm. and like kind of having the uh, the kind of obvious opposites as you said the, the, the benedict and francis the uh conservative wall building side versus mm-hmm. the more open-minded uh bleeding heart side you know having them butt heads literally like it, it, it's cool you know um, I think I think the main sticking point for the movie with people is how they feel about the flashback scenes with Francis, where we learn more about his uh, uh, life during the Dirty War in Argentina. But mm-hmm. everything with uh, Benedict and Francis, I really loved, and just you know I, Hopkins. I think this is one of his best performances in a long time. Maybe that doesn't say much. He's just kind of behind chasing the bag lately, but. He he doesn't make Benedict come off as like the more cartoony conservative guy. I think a lot of people if we've thought of him, and he's not like he's never been like a likable figure, whether you're a Catholic or not. Mm-hmm. But you kind of get the sense that like there's like more going on with Benedict. Like that line where he's like, "When I try and be myself, people don't seem to like me very much." Mm-hmm. Kind of a bit of uh, soul searching in that line reading. Yeah. So I, I really liked Hopkins in particular, and I know he's definitely in the mix for best supporting actor. And Price was also good as well. You know, uh, he has experience playing religion, of course, with the High Sparrow on Game of Thrones. So <laughs> didn't require as much range. But <laughs> no, it's uh, I like it just because like when when they're talking and having 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 it to just talking to each other, whether it's combative or not, it's just really uh, I think compelling conversation, especially mm-hmm. like that scene in the Sistine Chapel at the end. Yeah, no, that I mean, that, that is like the the part I like the most is it's like um, the old school versus the new school debating it out in these really beautiful settings, and especially you know when when Ratzinger finally kind of sees um, his path and, and makes the decision of what he wants to do, and you know they're sitting in the Sistine Chapel having this debate, and it's almost. Like, like Francis um, or Pope Francis compelling Benedict to uh, to not you know step down and mm, which is kind right. of funny because it's about these two guys who just both want to quit their jobs basically and the other one yeah. kind of convince them not to um, which is I mean, when you boil it down it's a funny concept but I, I actually didn't have as much of a problem with the the Francis stuff you know that I understand I think I can understand the critique of it and mm-hmm. certainly you know like the earlier early uh, or the young Jorge Bergoglio stuff is it's tough because you see this um, 
I think some of the real evilness and that and some of the real terror that the people in Argentina were going through at that time. I mean, just awful things are happened during dirty war, but I actually felt like the way that it, it kind of set up for Francis finding himself, finding the path of becoming a priest through confession. And then the way that that's mirrored with him confessing this unknown part of himself, uh, un part of himself to the church, to the Pope mm -hmm. prior to being, you know, the, the Pope stepping down and being absolved. I felt like that was so, so massively done and set up and structured throughout the movie that I thought that was actually really effective. Um, but I, I certainly, I guess I could see people not liking some of the, the backstory of, Fra of Francis for sure. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it looks really good and stuff. I, I don't, I, I thought it was okay, but it was fine. But just because it's, it's taking you away from Benedict and Francis talking, which was just much more compelling stuff, mm -hmm. you know, whereas that backstory ultimately is more wikipedia -ing. you know it's like yeah uh this controversial past for francis um benedict was of hitler youth in his early years as well like there's a lot of you mm -hmm. know stuff going on there people kind of know it now uh but like the conversations and like that that really when they're just kind of talking around each other and breaking down each other's metaphors and stuff like that. that that's where the movie shines. And it's, you know, it's really just an acting showcase because it's just, you know, really a true two-hander. And it's kind of funny, like this is kind of one yeah. of those like po poster child movies for category fraud because they're, they're co-leads in the movie. Like Ho Hopkins is not a supporting actor, really. He's just the other lead. Yet for the purpose of awards, yeah. you gotta, gotta run yeah. him supporting. That's how it works. Yeah, I, I guess if you had to pick one to be supporting, it would be him, but you're right, they are co-leads. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really have too much more to say about this movie. I thought uh, the, the Pope's, like, summer villa was pretty cool. Uh, definitely yeah, very great. nice, and I think embodies the, the thing Francis is kind of against, like the wealth of the church, mm -hmm. and I think it does that really effectively. Um, any other thoughts on Two Popes before we wrap it up? Um, I guess it kind of skirts the whole, like, church dropping the ball in a major way on abuse. Like they kind of mention it and they keep going as if it's just one of many things they disagree on. There's no added weight to it. And given that we're not going off transcripts of their conversations, maybe it would have been cooler to see them go into something like that, you know? But yeah, it's, it, it's a, I think it's a compelling movie and, you know, just great acting. So it's, it's a, I think it's a pretty easy sell if you like that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's on Netflix. So why you wouldn't check it out, I don't really know. Um, anyways, why don't we finish up today with some Little Women. Little Women 2019. This is like the, the Blade Runner 2049 version of Little Women. Uh, <laughs> you know, following up the 1994 make where... Who, who's in that? Kirsten Dunst played Amy. Winona Ryder was Joe. Mm -hmm. Who else we got? Susan uh, Sarandon was Marmy. Christian yeah. Bale was Lori. Yeah. And that, oh, you said, you say Claire Danes? No, I didn't say Claire Danes. Claire Danes was Beth. Gotcha. Yeah, those are the major ones. Uh, I have not seen that one. I'm aware of it. Dave, you watched it recently. What did you think? Yeah, so I watched it just a few days before I saw this new one from Greta Gerwig. And I, you know, I mean, we, we all kind of know of Little Women and of Louisa May Alcott. I never read the book. Um, I think it's just, it gener historically speaking, it's a book that's just kind of put in the hands of young girls more than young men. That's young boys. Mm -hmm. That's, I think that's why neither of us have read the book. But um, yeah, I, I liked it. You know, I, for me, it was just kind of cool to grasp the story and get the plot because I knew there was some subtle changes to the plot in this new movie. And yeah, it, it's good. You know, um, uh, Winona Ryder, I think it was really good. This is really at the peak, peak of Winona Ryder, you know, right around like Beetlejuice and mm. her early nineties run where she really was the hottest thing going at the time. Um, and Kirsten Dunst is a really, really good Amy. Cause she's playing her truly as like the young brat that she's supposed <laughs> to be in the, in the, the beginning of the story. Um, and you know, it look, looks like a you know period setting, so I, I, I liked it a lot. And Young Bale uh, was, was a good Laurie, um, but then seeing the new one, 
and seeing the changes Greta makes, most uh, obviously with telling the story in a nonlinear fashion. For one, knowing the story, it helped me follow the movie and appreciate what was being done. Uh, but also, it was cool to have like previous versions of the characters that I could then play off of. And I will say that uh, Chalamet and Sersha are like <sighs> the the best versions of these characters. Like it, it just fucking closed the book, man. It's done. They're 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 fucking insane in this movie. It's so good. On the screen, I was so sad that they didn't end up together in this. I, I was like literally protesting. I walked out with with my fiance, and I was like, man how the hell do they not end up together is that really how it is in the book like how is this like the case mm -hmm. it was uh, uh upsetting but man i really love seeing them together um you know but before we get too far into it uh you're talking about like the non-linear timeline of it which i think works really effectively um especially as it like builds out backstory around some of the things happening in the present or the, the things that happened in the past but the way Gerwig uses color and tone in those shots to kind of delineate like this is a shot that's happening in the past versus the present spe yep. specifically giving it warm tones in the in the lighting uh for the past shots versus very cold more blue um less lively colors in the the present I think it, it is very easy to keep up with the shifting timelines. Is that a critique you've seen where people are confused by it, the structure? I saw it mentioned a little bit, but yeah, I, I mean, another, like, like Joe's hair is way different timeline to timeline. Like, I, I, don't, I don't think it's hard to follow, but again, I had just seen the original yeah. one a few days before. So maybe I'm not the best person to yeah. ask, but yeah, I mean, just from the the whole production design aspect too, and costumes and all that is it, so top notch. I think they really do make a great point of making sure you know exactly where you are in the story. Part of this is, uh, you know, in 1994, Little Women, Kirsten Dunst stops being Amy in the later timelines, a new older actress. But obviously, in this one, Florence Pugh plays Amy the whole time. Um, that's a change, mm -hmm. but. I think Forrest be such a good actress. I don't know. You, uh, you never would want to recast her. And even if maybe she's not the most believable, like young teenager anymore, I didn't really mind. I didn't need to have those specific ages um, <laughs> stack up. It was fine to me. Um, I was thinking about that. Just give me more Florence Pugh. Dude. <laughs> well, I, ultimately, I think one of the best scenes in the movie is where she, uh, Amy lays out the economic benefit of marriage to women of the time in the 1860s and what it means to be a woman and be a married woman and having her spell that out to Lori and the audience really rounds out the character of Amy to me and she's not as likable in other portrayals other adaptations but I think it makes you understand more of how her and Lori come together at the end well also I think just adding like a way more agency to her character. So that was one of the changes or just additions that I, I really liked. Um, one thing I, I was thinking though about the ages of the cast. So initially Emma Stone was going to be playing uh, Meg and then she dropped out due to I think scheduling and Emma Watson came in. Obviously a reverse of La La Land back in yep. the day. But I was thinking, you know, Emma Stone uh, does look a little older. You know, she does look like she's in her early 30s like she is. Mm -hmm. So I think Emma Watson I think was a more convincing older sister to mm -hmm. Saoirse, Florence Pugh, and uh, Eliza Scanlon. So I kind of like that change, to be honest. Yeah, no, I, I think the casting, this is great. Um, the one knock, I guess I, I would have, if I had to say anything about the performances, is that uh, Emma Watson just cannot keep her away from her British accent. Yeah. Like, especially <laughs> when she starts to cry, like, she's just, she just goes straight Hermione Granger. Um, which is fine, you know. And, and like the casting, this is freaking awesome. Like Laura Dern as Marmy mm -hmm. plays that role so perfectly, and I, she just won the Globe last night for Best Supporting Actress in Marriage Story. But I would almost say that this performance is a little bit better. You know, it's a little bit more tempered. Um, mm -hmm. She gets to do a little bit more rather than just be this like kind of over the top lawyer. I right. Feel like in Marriage Story. Uh, um, Really, I really love her in this, and Laura Dern again 
remains uh, on fire in all of her perform everything she does. Um, Streep, I think, is also good as well. I- I'm March, like mm-hmm. just being cynical as shit. <laughs> yep. Um, one 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 casting thing I did have an issue with seeing Bob Odenkirk as the father. Really, <laughs> like I did not I did not know he was in this. And I just found myself being like, oh shit, that's Bob Odenkirk. Like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Like really took me out of it for a second, um, but yeah, no, this is this was a, a delight to watch, and like like you said, Chalamet and and Saoirse are just fantastic. Yeah, I mean the the scene on the hill, um, man, just blows the scene on the hill for nineteen ninety four out of the water, man. Oh my oh, god, really? um, and that's it's funny because we're talking about fucking Nora Ryder and young Christian Bale of all people, but like Saoirse and. Chalamet, as we've said at nauseum, are like, you know, the new goats of their generation. We'll be talking about them forever. And mm-hmm. yeah, like you said, they have they have such good chemistry. But also there's a I think I think Lori has a few more lines in this, just just off my guess, you know. Um, which I liked. Also, they let Joe they give Joe a little bit more like control over the the, the telling of the story because not linearity, you have her talking to Tracy Letts about selling the book. Um, that doesn't happen in the original one. That's brand new for this. I like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're, again, they're just, they're so world-class that when you pair them together, and again, they've already acted off each other before in Lady Bird, to, to pair them together in such a major way like this um, and then have them carry emotional scenes, it's, uh, there's really nothing better than it, you know? Um, no. And like, as you mentioned with Emma Watson, Emma Watson, good actress. But when, when you're comparing her next to Sersha and Florence and Timothy, it's a, uh, it's a little more noticeable. Oh, for sure. Um, there, there are levels to this shit, right? And I think, uh, uh Chalamet, Pew, and Sersha are low. Um, we didn't even talk about Eliza Scanlon yet. How did you feel about her in the movie? I mean, she's really just, playing like the the heartbeat the soul of the family right yeah goodness i guess and that's what happens with beth beth gets sick beth dies makes people sad Mm -hmm. that's what beth's supposed to do but she gets a few other lines you know stuff at the piano stuff like that um and like eliza scanlon we know she's really good from sharp objects so even if she's really playing the uh fourth fifth fiddle in all her scenes uh you know it just kind of Eleve, ele, elevates the floor of, of the movie when you have someone like her just kind of, you know, coming in relief once in a while. Yeah, yeah. I don't really have too too much to critique the movie on. Just just things I really liked about it. Honestly, um, I guess where I, the question I'm left with is, where does this place Greta? Uh, you know, in terms of wh- where she goes next and just her status as a director in Hollywood. I mean, could her stock be higher right now? No, oh, and that's the thing too. Coming off Lady Bird, when we knew she was adapting Little Women, something that's been adapted a thousand times. There literally was a TV show version last year with Catherine Newton, and Maya Hawke, for crying out loud. Mm-hmm. Um, once we heard it was Little Women, people were like, "Ah, oh, that's that's cool. Do you? But you can do anything right now. Why are you going to do this?" And then to see such an inspired take, and I think pretty universally the best version of the take. Yeah again just raises the expectations once again so mm-hmm. it's uh it, it, she's she has to be the best working director uh, female director right now and that speaks more to her uh, her peers and the lack of chances people get when they're when they're women in hollywood more than anything but uh yeah i mean these these are two home runs back to back you know so yeah it's it's great yeah it, it's awesome to see and i i just can't wait to see what she makes next now i mean we we talk we've been talking a little bit more about like who's got our season passes and we've been talking about it mostly with tx so I'll, I'll be there to see whatever it is so the way she gets performances out of people is just phenomenal um and i also like that she seems to be like gathering like her, her people like Chalamet mm. and Sersha and maybe now Florence are like this is like her crew of like who's, yeah who's she's be becoming like Wes crew. Anderson it's pretty exciting yes exactly <laughs> or maybe more like Scorsese we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll 
say Scorsese a bit more. Uh, last thoughts on the movie? Um, it's made $80 million worldwide so far. Definitely has been exceeding expectations, having great holds thus far. Um, I think this will help as an Oscar. You know, th- there was some fear that this movie might fade away, but I think it's going to do decently at the Oscars, um, even if Greta probably won't crack through. Um, and that's awesome to see because there was some, um, you know, worry that men weren't going to show up for this. And they're not showing up too much, but it doesn't matter sometimes. And it's not mattering here. So it's great to see this movie really doing well. Absolutely. We're going to wrap up there for this week. Dave, what should the people be watching or listening to for next week? Uh, yeah. So a week from today, we have the Oscar nominations announced. And that's obviously really important. We also have Just Mercy coming out wide, 1917 finally coming out. Uh, thanks, thanks for finally releasing the movie to us normal people. We appreciate <laughs> that. Um, Selena Gomez is dropping a record. Kesha is dropping a record. Poppy's dropping a record. So, yeah, what? early January. Getting back into it. Uh, I think on the TV front, nothing for another week or so, but new popes on the horizon. So, Hell yeah. things are coming. Things are coming. And also be on the lookout for our best of 2019 movies, which should be out either later this week or early next week. Um, so subscribe, youtube.com slash nostalgiapod, soundcloud.com slash nostalgiapod, and hit us up on Twitter at nostalgiapod as well. We will catch you next week.